Anyway, today we're going to talk about how to build others up. And see, it took him all these, these weeks to finally figure out to be a blessing to people. In the message today, what I'm going to talk about is if you'll apply what I'm going to talk about today, you'll find more joy in your Christian life. You will uh, be able to encourage the people around you everywhere you are, whether it's work or home. And I even believe it will make your marriage better. Regardless of where you're at and what's happening in your marriage, I believe that if you will apply these principles I'm going to talk about today, that it really will change your life. But here's the key question we're going to talk about today. Are you really building others up or are you really building yourself up? Is your motivation really to do what God wants you to do to build others up or are you just trying to make yourself feel better by you know, being nice to people or whatever? So I believe in life we're given two things, mainly verbally, but not just verbally. This is a brick or a block. And, you know, every day we have choices to add to people's lives. We, we can build onto their lives, encourage them. How many of you have ever had somebody call you and it changed your mood for the better? Let me try this one. How many of you have ever had somebody call you and it changed your mood for the worse, right? Okay, you remember that one, right? You're like, this one, yeah. So, so here's the thing about building others up. You build others up. It's brick by brick. It's a, it's a little bit of an encouragement, a little bit of a blessing. It's a, hey, you know what I've seen in you? It's, it's when you see a child in, or your grandchild or, or your nephew or niece, you say, you know, I've noticed that you're really good at this. And, and you just build them up. You go out of your way to look for something in them that you can encourage. But we've also been given a sledgehammer. Now, this is a baby sledgehammer. It takes skill to build into somebody's life. It takes no skill to tear somebody down. It doesn't take any wisdom. It doesn't take any thought. It doesn't take any thoughtfulness. You can add a little bit of anger and you can hurt people. What, what you have spent years building, you can tear down in seconds with your words. And so today, as I talk about how to build others up, I want to look not just at what we're talking about and some specifics and some practical things. I want to even look at our motivation. Because if your goal is just to build others up so you can feel good about yourself, you're always going to feel like it's not enough. But if through God's grace you learn to receive God's love and that love flows out of you to other people, then you'll learn how to put this away and you'll learn how to add value to other people. So today let's look at three, I want to give it real practical, three ways to build others up. Number one, be sensitive to struggles. Be sensitive to struggles. How many of you know somebody who's struggling? Anybody know somebody who's struggling? Right? And when you know somebody's struggling with something, you try to be sensitive to that. You try to care about what they're struggling with. Here's what Paul says. Now let me give you the two issues that Paul's dealing with in this verse because it won't make sense to you if I don't. Paul's dealing with two primary issues. Remember in this <clears throat> passage in the book of Romans, he's taking a collection for the Jewish church going back to Jerusalem. That's one of the things he's doing. And as uh, Christians and non-Christians and people who came out of pagan worship became Christians, some of them didn't want to, they, there was a danger of going back to old practices, ways they used to do things. So if you were a pagan, you um, would sacrifice food to idols. And when you would sacrifice food to idols, by the way, most people don't know, most offerings are not burnt offerings. So when you sacrificed food to an idol, you basically cooked it, right? And then you would take part of it home. In some cases, even a store might sell uh, uh, some of those things. So you might have bail burgers if you went to the Publix of Rome that day, right? So you go into Rome, Publix... And they got it nicely wrapped, and the, and the meat market manager says, yep, those, those were just sacrificed to Baal uh, just a few minutes ago. So what happened is when people would bring Baal burgers home, and they were Christians, and they invited a friend who had just come out of Baal worship over, that friend would say, well, are we still worshiping Baal too? They, they didn't understand. It was confusing to them. And so Paul in this says, you need to be sensitive to people who struggle with that. And then the other thing they were dealing with is the Jews thought you should go to church on Saturday, which last night the people were so glad that I said that. They came to church last night. 
But then early Christians began very quickly to adopt Sunday service because maybe you don't know why we go to church on Sunday. Now you'll know. So when somebody says, why do you guys go to church on Sunday? Because that's when the resurrection happened. But Paul actually makes it a bigger issue than that. Watch what he says here, and um, uh, you'll get to hear about both these things. Here's what Paul says. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Now, disputable matters means not the big issues. We're not talking about, is Jesus Lord? <laughs> We're not talking about, did Jesus die and rise again? We're talking about whether or not you should have wine with dinner. Whether or not you should dance at a party. You remember when that was a big deal? Nobody, nobody cared about that anymore. Yeah. One person faith allows them to eat anything. But another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. How many of you know those people that eat only vegetables? Anybody know those people? You're supposed to love them. Watch. I'll show you. Even if they tell you all the time, you know, you should just eat vegetables. You know, I went to, I cannot eat. I'm like Mr. Rogers. I cannot eat somebody's mom. That's what Mr. Rogers used to say. Did you know that? Anyway, so the one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. I eat only vegetables. How dare you eat bacon, pastor? For God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, their servant stands or falls. They will stand for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person, ready? Here's the days. One person considers one day more sacred than the other. Sacred means to set apart. One person considers, hey, church should be Saturday. Or church should be Sunday. But listen to what Paul says next. This might sit in your lap for a minute. Here we go. Another considers every day alike. Basically, they're all sacred. They're all dedicated to God. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. For they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so, and the Lord gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. What, what that's asking in general, before we skip to the next verse, what it's asking in general is, am I doing this for me or for God? Am I doing this thing just because it makes me feel more religious? Or am I really doing it because I feel like that's what God wants me to do? Do you see the difference in motivation? Now, nobody can tell that from the outside. I don't know your motivations. You can come up to me and go, oh, pastor, I think that was the best sermon. And then get in the car and go, isn't that awful? I can't believe I told him it was good, right? I mean, our outward is one thing, and, and what's inside is not always the same. And then it continues. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking but of righteousness, peace, and joy of the Holy Spirit because everyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. I love this. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. By the way, that verse does not say you can always bring peace. There are people you will try to bring peace with, and guess what? They don't want peace. They want to fight, right? We all, everybody has a relative like that, right? You got that uncle or that cousin, right? And you're like, I like to fight about everything. But you do everything you can do to lead to peace. You know, we went on this trip and, and you should know that the pastor never gets on his flights. So we booked a flight to fly to Utah. It's like the farthest I've ever flown across country. I've flown around the world, but I've never flown across country. So I thought, you know what, we're going to go Delta. Delta's price is about the same. So we're going to go with Delta, and we're going to sit in the back because I'm cheap. So, you know, so, so I, but I was early enough that I got about three rows from the entrance, you know, three rows right together. We were going to sit together. The plane broke down. So I called my sister who works for Delta. I said, what should I do? She said, you better book another flight. It doesn't say when it's going to fly. So I booked another flight, and it said, you will book your seats when you get to the check-in at the gate. So an hour before the flight, I'm still sitting there going, where in the world am I sitting? Am I going to have a seat on this plane? So I was the first one standing up there. And then I said, I'm here too early. So I sat down, and another guy stood up in front of me. I should have stayed there. 
So uh, as soon as I saw him stand up, I got there. Hour and a half before the flight. He does whatever he does. And I come up and I said, is there any way we can sit together? She said, absolutely. I said, uh, she said, but I've only got one row left for you to sit together. The back row of the plane. I said, okay. I figured it's better to sit together than sit all over the plane. I was wrong. <laughs> so I was in the aisle in the back of the plane next to both bathrooms. And my sister's a flight attendant, but let me let you know something. I got scars on this shoulder from the cart hitting me when they came through. By the way, my sister knew all the flight attendants. They were very sweet. Then they didn't do it on purpose. My sister said, that first row is hard to get through. I'm like, yeah, I noticed. If you haven't noticed, my shoulders are wider than an airplane seat. That doesn't mean I have broad shoulders. It just means the airplane seats are small. So it wasn't too bad, though. You know, they'd come through once in a while and hit me. But then everybody started to line up for the bathroom. That wasn't even too bad, even though people were standing over me the whole time. Until one guy came. And I'm sitting here. And he's, he's headed to the bathroom. And he grabs the armrest. My armrest. <laughs> At first, I turned away from him. Because I thought, well, he's just going to be there for a second. Maybe he's got a cramp. No, no. And you can't go in. These seats don't even lean back like regular seats. I'm just sitting there. And finally, I just look at him. And here's what I did. It's a very 80s. Dude. He's like, oh, oh, sorry. Dude, get off of me, right? I should have coughed. <laughs> My Corona. I'm telling you, I could come up with a new song. Now, here's why I said that whole story. We live in a world that is not sensitive to other people. If you really care about how other people feel. Now, I'm not talking about you being oversensitive. I'm not talking about you changing your whole boundaries and letting people doormat you. You know, and you just do whatever they want because you want to be sensitive. No, no, no. But just caring about people. Caring about their space, not grabbing on a chair, their armrest, when they only have four inches of space anyway. Most bizarre thing, I got to say. this one. Doesn't surprise anybody in this church, though, does it? Does that surprise anybody? So here's the first question. Am I sensitive and looking for ways to build others up? Too often we argue about things that don't matter and we don't take time to look for things that matter and how we can encourage somebody. We would rather talk about the negative in the world than to inspire somebody to do something better. So be careful. And by the way, TV does the same thing. The news does the same thing. Hurricane season's coming. They'll show that hurricane 50 times. And you'll sit and watch it. Go, go for a walk. I love what Chuck Swindoll says. Encouragement is awesome. It can actually change the course of another person's day, week, or life. I had a friend call me. I was headed to Orlando. Oh, I just love driving on I-4. It's where my Christianity really is tested. <laughs> and so I was driving over to Orlando, and um, uh, this guy called me and just talked to me for a couple minutes about something. I hung up the phone, and I remember thinking, I'm so encouraged. Before that, here's, here was my attitude. No, I'll just be honest with you. Oh, man, I hate this drive. This is getting from 408 to I-4. That little, they have made it where you got about three feet to get over. Okay, maybe four. And, and nobody wants to let you in, you know? And, and so I'm like, man, I wish I had a Hummer. This is the point. We just, just go, right? And people don't want to let me in, and I go anyway, you know, the whole deal. And I was just kind of thinking that way. And he called me, and all of a sudden, my whole attitude changed. You can do that for other people. Now, I know there's some people that no matter how much you pour in their bucket, their bucket's cracked, right? So it just flows out. You, all day long, you can be positive with them, and they're just going to look at you and go, yeah, but it's not true. You know, they're the Debbie Downer. You know what Debbie Downer is? You know, she, you say something, and they're like, well, you could get coronavirus. <laughs> we're going on a trip. Yeah, you might die on the way out there. Well, we're going on a cruise. Well, did you hear what happened on that cruise the other day? <laughs> right? encourage somebody go out of your way hey when's the last time you told somebody something positive you saw in them when's the last time you said to somebody what you see in them see you know the word eulogy we use it at funerals do you know it's just to bless somebody 
And you really should do that while they're living. I mean, I mean, I, I'm sure that sometimes people are watching their funeral going, I wish they had told me that before. Right? Is that too weird of a conversation? All right. Number two. So we're, we're sensitive to struggle and then carry and care for others. I love this image in Luke chapter 5. I feel like this is who our church is. In Luke chapter 5, there's a story about four friends who their friend has been on a mat, cannot walk, probably begging because a lot of times the beggars had a, had a special mat they sat on. And they pick up their friend and they go to take him to Jesus and they get to where Jesus is and it's crowded and they can't get in. So they go home. No, that's not what happened, right? I'm sure there were other people that happened too. But the reason it's in the Bible is because that's not what they did. They said, we're going to get you to Jesus no matter what it takes. So they went up on the roof. Now, I'm not sure what the homeowner thought about this part of the story. They dug through that thatch and tar roof. I don't know where they got ropes from. Maybe they made them. But they lowered their friend in front of Jesus. Stuff falling on Jesus' head. The homeowner going, oh, I hope you got insurance, right? And as he's laid in front of Jesus, you know what Jesus said? He said, your faith to those four people healed him. See, this is what the church should be. We should be carrying people to Jesus. That's what it's about. It's not about our building. It's not about the stuff we do. It's not about uh, uh, even serving people. If we're not taking them to Jesus, we can do all kind of religious things. But we need to take them to Christ. That's the goal. Help people find their way home. That's all we want. So listen to what Paul says here. We who are strong ought to bear with the failing of the weak and not to please ourselves. Time out. This word bear, we translate a lot of times in our heads as put up with. Because we all know that one person who's weak, who drives us crazy. Right? That person that we know, we're like, I'm putting up with them for Jesus. This word bear literally means to carry. We should carry those who are weak. It's the idea that when somebody doesn't have their act together, we don't kick them when they're down. Which, by the way, a lot of Christians shoot their wounded, right? What do we do instead? We care. Hey, I'm gonna, when you're going through a hard time, I'm going to carry you. Every once in a while, somebody will say, well, I don't know why I need to go to church. And I say, maybe you don't, but maybe you're there to carry somebody else. Maybe you're there to help lift somebody else up. You know, to be a part of a church, guess what you have to do? You have to show up. We got people who say, I'm a part of that church. And I'm like, I've never seen, I don't know, who is that? They, who, what? If you're going to carry people, you got to get close enough to them to carry them. So he says, carry one another's burdens. By the way, a lot easier not to, right? You can just sit at home, watch TV, have a virtual reality life. But it's heavy when you care, but not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbor, listen, listen, for their good. You know, it's like when your parents used to spank you. I'm doing this for your good. And if you're a smart aleck, you say, then let me spank you. And then you got more. <laughs> to build them up. They're back to building. Can we turn the air on if it's not on? Just a little. Thank you. For even Christ did not please himself, but it is written, the insults of those whose insults have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past. Now, here's what he's talking about. He's saying those stories from the Old Testament. Why are they there? This is why they're there. Everything that was written in the past to teach us so that through the endurance taught in scriptures. You hear that? Through the endurance. So you see what people endured. You look at Joseph and you think, I don't know that I could have done that. And God's like, notice I was with him the whole way. When he was dragged off by people he didn't know to a country he did not know that didn't even speak the same language. When then he was uh, charged and, and thrown into jail for something he did not do. I don't know, if you weren't discouraged after the first problem, maybe the second problem would do it. That's what the enemy does, by the way. He thinks, well, I didn't get him with the first one. I'm going to get him with the second one. And God uses those moments to train us and to shape us. What the enemy thinks he's winning and God is actually doing a work in you. He's making you more like him. Joseph in prison learned how to manage people that were difficult. You ever think about that? Made him a lot better leader later on. And then what happens? He translates a couple of dreams. Then he's stuck again. They forget about him. And then he comes out. What? We read, and then he comes out and he becomes second in command. And then his brothers show up. 
It's time to get even, right? And instead, he says, God brought you here. God used what you did to me for his good. We see that endurance and we read those stories and we think, God, help me to walk in endurance, whatever we're going through. And the encouragement they provide, we may have hope. And then he says, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement. Do any of you need endurance? Endurance is the opposite of bear under or bear with. It is when something's put on top of you. You're able to carry it. So he says, through endurance and encouragement, give you the same attitude and mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind, one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then listen to this last verse. Accept one another. Then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Now, don't hear this being different than what it says. Accept one another means I accept who you are. It doesn't mean that you have to say everything you do is fine. Don't you do things sometimes that you're like, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. Right? So you don't have to accept that doesn't mean that you look at that and you overlook it. Oh, sin doesn't matter. That's not what this means. But it means you love people even when they're broken and messed up and unkind and they say the wrong things and they do the wrong things. And if you're around anybody long enough, guess what? You got to learn to accept them or you're going to walk away. So accept them. And then it says, and then for their good. Are we going to love people for their good or for our good? Are we just trying to do something for somebody so they'll be happy with us? Or are we really saying, God, help me to love and care about them, th them because I care about them because of your love? One of my favorite stories about a seminary professor who lived in New Orleans. And one of his neighbors went out of town for two weeks. After the first week, he thought, well, I'm going to go mow his grass for Jesus. And so he went over and he mowed the guy's grass it was knee high by a week. I mean, it's New Orleans. He mowed it. A week later, the neighbor came home. And when the neighbor came home, the grass was knee high again. The neighbor had no idea he mowed it. He said he struggled with this. He was so tempted to go over to the guy and say, by the way, I mowed your grass. But then he said, but I did it for Jesus. And then he found that he even got mad that the guy didn't notice and thank him. And he said he was praying one day and it was like the Lord said to him, I thought you did that for me. Whenever you're serving God and something doesn't go right, that's when you really discover who you're serving. I can remember years ago setting up chairs in the community center. And one week, for whatever reason, all the other people that were setting up chairs weren't there. And I remember setting up chairs. And here's the conversation I have with myself. I can't believe I'm setting up chairs. I wonder how many pastors in the world are setting up chairs. I can't believe I'm out here. Somebody else should be saying, I'm getting sweaty and I'm setting up chairs. And I was, and the Lord said, is that? Are you doing it for me or for other people? Oh. Listen, if you serve God anywhere, whether it's at home or church or work, there's going to be times where you're going to be tested. You're, you're going to help with something and somebody's going to yell at you and you're going you're to have the opportunity to say, I'm not doing that anymore. Or to say, I'm sorry. And to realize you're doing it for God, not to please those people. Do I carry and accept others who struggle? Number three, be sensitive to struggles. Carry and care for others. Number three, provide and pray for others. When we learn to give and help others, not only does it make us feel better, but it contributes to God's kingdom. One of the reasons Paul wrote this letter to Romans was he was taking a collection to help other people. See, some of you think giving is a new thing. By the way, I want to encourage you, if you're going to learn to give, you have to learn to budget first. So learn to budget. Look up Dave Ramsey. Google it. You can find a budget online. Start budgeting. Most Americans have no idea where their money's going. So learn how to do that. And by the way, I have no idea what anyone gives. So if you're looking at me going, well, he knows I haven't given a dime. I'm not. I have no idea. I just figure you're all giving tons of money every day. Right? Oh, if you laugh, that's not good. That's not Okay. Anyway. <laughs> For Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. Remember, the Jews were going back to Jerusalem that had been kicked out. And now Jewish Christians were going back. And Paul was saying, hey, we need to help them. They're struggling. They were pleased to do it. And indeed, they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them in material blessings. So Paul's saying, hey, hey, we need to go out of our way for the Jewish people 
because that's where our heritage is. And then it continues. So after I've completed this task and have made sure they've received this contribution, I'll go to Spain and visit you on the way. I know that when I come to you, I'll come in full measure of the blessing of Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle. Listen, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Do you know anybody who's struggling? You ever feel like, I wish I could take that from them? The Bible says you can join them in their struggle by praying for them. Now, sometimes you feel like, well, that's not my... No, no, you can join. God, would you... And you ask God how to pray for people. Ask God what they need. When somebody's in the hospital, you know, you can pray for healing, but then you can say, but God, how else should I pray? Lord, help them not to get discouraged. Lord, help them, them not to get down. Lord, bring somebody who will bring light to them, maybe a nurse or a doctor who would, who would maybe come with your light to them to encourage them. Ask God how to pray. Be in part of their struggle. And then he says, pray that I may be kept safe from unbelievers in Judea and that the contribution I take to Jerusalem may be favorably received by the Lord's people there. So I may come with you with joy by God's will and in your company be refreshed. And in your company be refreshed. Refresh. Now, this word refreshed is really a neat word. Do you remember the nest tea plunge? We totally get that in Florida. July's coming, right? By the way, it's like, what was it, 40 degrees this morning? It's going to be 90 by Wednesday. So you're going to need some nest tea. What do you do? You drink the nest tea, and what do you do? Take the nest tea plunge. It's refreshing. If you allow God's love to flow into you, then you can bring refreshment to other people. You can be the nest tea plunge of believers to, to build them up. Because the world, listen, the world is knocking people down every day. The enemy comes and tells them they're worthless and they don't matter and who cares. And you, you're, you're not anything important. You just evolve from whatever and, and you're not really special. You're just who you are. It doesn't matter. And you can come and say, you are special. God loves you. I love you. I care about you. You can build those bricks into their lives. And you and I can bring refreshment to people who live in a dry and weary land. People who are exhausted from this world. So my final question for you is this. Am I generous? Do I pray for others? I love that we're generous as a church. We're helping four churches right now that are getting started. Three in Brevard County, one in, in, uh, uh, down in uh, Sebastian. And then we also give money to missions around the world. Over 10% of our offerings go to help people here and around the world to do this. Why? Because we know it's not just about us. This is a kingdom thing. We want to see God do great things in our community and in other communities. And so we know, God, none of these things are yours. None of these things are ours. They're all yours. And so we want to use them to bless other people. I promise you, if you will look for ways to build others up, you will find more joy in your life. If you do it for God and not just so the other person will acknowledge you. If you'll wash the dishes at your house and not expect your spouse to notice. And never do angry dishes. Just like me with the chairs, right? If you'll do those things and say, God, I'm doing this for you, whether anybody notices or not. If you begin to have that attitude, guess what? You'll find joy in the most mundane task. You're not trying to please people. You're trying to please God. So even if they come home and, and they drop their shoes on the floor and then the socks follow and then the shirts after that and you just cleaned up. I'm not saying you don't say, hey, can you pick your stuff up? But it doesn't freak you out because you didn't clean the house for them anyway. You did it for God, and he saw, and he noticed it was clean, even if nobody else did. So, God, that's how we want to serve you. We want to serve you every day, building others up. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, I thank you for people in my life who've encouraged me over the years and inspired me and challenged me and built me up. Lord, when I went through the darkest times of life where it seemed like there were so many people just with hammers, just tearing, trying to tear everything down, that, Father, you brought people who carried me, who lifted me up, who took me to you, who lifted me up in prayer. And, Father, I know there's others here today who right now are on the mat. Father, they feel exhausted. They can't do anymore. Maybe they're watching online today. 
Father, I pray even now they would know that there are brothers and sisters lifting them up. And Father, I thank you that we don't have to get it all right to build others up. There's times we say the wrong thing and do the wrong thing and you still love us. And you can use us even though we don't have it all together. Father, help us to be encouragers and those who bless others. In Jesus' name, amen.